Hello, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. If you're new here, what happens? One of my writers, in this case, Dennis. Thank you, Dennis, has written me a script. The Bell Island Boom, Canada's weirdest mystery, and we all know how weird Canada is. It's gonna be, I don't know, that's a bad joke. Canada's not that weird. Oh, uh, um. Is Canada weird? Canada's mostly known, like, I know it's cold, maple syrup, Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> Let's just jump into it, shall we? I've never read this before, that's the format. <laughs> Just before we get started, a word from today's fantastic sponsor, Vessi. Have you heard of Vessis? If no, well, now you have. That's right. They are the sneaker that will change your life. And that feels like a strong statement. However, Vessi started sponsoring me two years ago. Roughly. Maybe a little bit longer now. I feel like it was in the summer. So maybe two and a half years ago. And since that time, I have basically worn nothing other than Vessi shoes. And uh, that's because, as they say right here, they're perfect for any weather. In the summer, somehow they keep your feet cool. In the winter, somehow they keep your feet warm. Even though it's the same pair of shoes. And most impressive beyond all of that is they're made from a material called Dymatex, which makes them fully waterproof. And you'll see some B-roll of me now wearing uh, this pair of shoes, which I'm actually wearing today. And uh, just going into a river, like up to here on the shoe. It's crazy. It's like a Wellington boot, like a fully waterproof boot, except it doesn't make your feet sweat and is horribly uncomfortable to wear. It's just a fantastic shoe that happens to be waterproof. And look, it's December. I don't know when this is going out, but it'll be close to Christmas. Now is the perfect time to gift someone some Vessies and change their life the way that Vessies have changed. It's not It's not even an exaggeration. It's they are the best shoes I've ever had without question. They're comfortable, lightweight, breathable. Talk about them and how you use them. I have done that already, Vessi. I've told you much I love them. And yeah, I've, they've got these ones. These are like a slip-on pair. These are a sporty pair. These are all nice and shiny because I don't wear them because I like showing them on screen. But I've got a pair of like, um, like, like sneaker classic sneaker shoes through there i've got the boots that i wear i love it all i love it all i got like five or six pairs now they're the perfect gift under the tree and for your feet check out their holiday sale at vessi.com unknown get the style and size you want now before they sell out if you missed the sale use the code unknown for 15 percent off your entire order vessi's are brilliant you should get them and get them for someone you love this christmas and uh yeah now today's episode oh and mr bennett sat down for supper. His cottage was suddenly swallowed by a dazzling globe. Seconds later, the inconceivable force of a million thunder strikes would unleash, tearing the sky open like a flimsy curtain. A radiant bubble quickly expanding and outmatching the brightness of the sun vanished as instantly as it had formed, discharging with a deafening blast. The torrent of light and energy shook the ground for miles as if the very fabric of reality had been ripped apart. A monumental shockwave thundered through the very eastern part of Newfoundland, flattening trees and vaporizing clouds along the path. For a few seconds, the blazing glare triggered every alarm of the Vela satellite system as the area emitted more light than the nuclear bombing of Hiroshima. Oh my god, if I was that dude, I'd be like, it's a nuclear bomb! Oh god, I'm screwed! Since that fateful day in 1978, residents of Bell Island have been scratching their heads as to how such a detonation had managed to emerge from nothing but thin air. It doesn't, I mean, a nuclear bomb doesn't emerge from thin air, but it's like, that's a big explosion. And you, the bomb is probably like, you know, a few meters big. You're not going to be able to see it. It's just going to go off and then you're going to be like, holy shit, that's a really big explosion for a really small thing because that's what nuclear weapons are. It's like some, it's the size of a van and it could destroy a city. It's mental. Mental. Yet, according to local rumors and whispers, it all started months earlier with nocturnal noise pollution. So, get comfy in your armchairs or your bed, set out a cup of hot cinnamon rosehip tea, and snuggle up under a warm wool blanket as I guide you through a metaphorical crack in the space time continuum all the way to a Canadian island roughly 50 years ago. I just realized I'm feeling quite old right now. It's like, yeah, roughly 50 years ago, 1978. I was born like 10 years after that. Come on. I'm not 40. Give me a break, Dennis. I already feel old enough, Dennis. Come on. Everyone else on YouTube's like 20. I'm like, ah, oh, the old man. Oh no. Chapter one, the story of Harbingers. If you had to travel back in time and visit Bell Island in the 1970s, you would have easily missed one very specific detail whose true spooky implications only the locals 
could have understood. It's not that this mystery was concealed in any way. On the contrary, it was impossible to avoid. Yet, it takes one crucial piece of information to fully comprehend its meaning, to fathom why it had been a conundrum to begin with. After docking on the small wooden jetty, the first thing you'd notice was the foreboding fog, which often rolled in for days, blanketing the secluded cane in an eerie white shroud. Clear days seldom came, if ever. And if the milky curtains did lift for once, they'd reveal nothing but the distant coastlines of the infinite Atlantic Ocean into which the island jutted forth, as if it was a scraggy finger of the North American continent. An abandoned lighthouse loomed over the small village like a decrepit sentinel who had nothing to guard bar a few shacks and abandoned iron mines. This sounds like a movie set. Like, you'd see some place like this, it'd be cold, there'd be fogs that never lift, there'd be an old lighthouse, there'd be some abandoned buildings, and I'd be like, <laughs> that's a bit Hollywood, isn't it? Places like that don't exist. But apparently they do, in Canada. It's probably why they make all those movies in Canada, right? Bell Island was a stretch of shallow mounds surrounded by solitude and treacherous bluffs as the surf surged in and out relentlessly. The only sounds breaking through the rumbling waves were dangling wind chimes and the occasional foghorn, which seemed to mock the isolation of this otherworldly place. Even though Bell Island had an electric infrastructure and was hooked up to cable TV, almost all technology seemed to have skipped most households. As you'd slowly make your way down the dirt road, you'd realize that the island was, in fact, almost completely deserted. Instead of crowded streets, you'd only stumble upon a few seemingly stray chickens who had taken to roaming the island in packs and if you paid attention, you could also spot the feral cats who hissed and disappeared in a blink if you got too close. <coughs> the ramshackle dwellings had their best days behind them, with peeling paint and weathered clothes lines hanging limply in the breeze, and the few people who were still around seemed to be barely scraping by. Yet the landscape around it was picturesque, albeit in a melancholic way, underscored by another wistful blow from the distant foghorn. Just over a hundred years earlier, Bell Island had been settled as an early industrial mining colony, but the bygone century had scarcely brought any wealth to its inhabitants. As soon as the last iron ores had been mined and the last lorry had left the shaft, eternal standstill set in for those who didn't relocate to the Canadian mainland. <laughs> Can you imagine just like working in Iowa? It's like it's closed, it's like, yeah, your house is there. And it's like, yeah, you're gonna stay here. It's like, no man let's get out of here there are no there's literally nothing to do and i mean i could not imagine somewhere that could be possibly more haunted than this island <laughs> the colony fell into oblivion to the outside world and so the world seemed to disappear from the cosmos of the few remaining residents. The local taverns were among the only few places where you could witness something resembling liveliness. The sworn hermit commune of basically a few hundred villagers would gather here, discussing the latest news and events in hushed tones, as if they were sharing state secrets. And maybe they were. What possible news could they have discussed? It was a bit foggy out this morning. Mate, it's foggy every morning. There's nothing to... Why did we stay here? Please, get me out. They would exchange stories about the booms, as they called them, and debate theories about their origin. And you, as a time-traveling, eavesdropping tourist, would suddenly realize the nocturnal foghorn sounds, which had blended so seamlessly into the gloomy aura, had no known source. There was no operational foghorn anywhere near the island. Contrary to the backward zeitgeist on Bell Island, we still find ourselves in the late 1970s. At this point, humankind had already set foot on the moon, dared the first experiments with video games, and had inherited and had invented important achievements such as digital cameras, LSD, feminism. <laughs> Navigating ships by radar had become standard at this point, with the seafaring industry slowly shifting towards satellite-based systems. There was no longer any need for ancient devices such as foghorns, which is also why Bell Island's lighthouse had been out of service. Nevertheless, the thunderous sounds were a recurring part of the late-night scenery. Most residents had become partially accustomed to being jolted awake by them, and yet they could not help but be somewhat concerned, for the time was not only overshadowed by great technolog technological advances. Yeah, I know exactly what they're going to say. It's like, there's giant beams going on in the 1970s. <laughs> It's bombs. Someone's testing nuclear bombs. I'll just be like, I'm just gonna, I know it's probably safe. I know the government probably not irradiating me, but you know, maybe they are. I'm just gonna buy one of those um, clicking things. The rad, rad meters? What are they called? Um, Geiger counters. I'm just gonna buy it just in case, you know, just gonna, just to keep me safe. Boom. Go, go to the mainland. Why did we never leave? 
But also by the Cold War, yes. Although the Cuban Missile Crisis had been overcome several years earlier, global tensions were far from over. Constantly reckoning with nuclear extinction was still deeply ingrained in people's minds. Thus, disembodied bangs made for a bad tummy feeling. Living under the constant threat of imminent doom changes people's minds irreversibly. From today's point of view, this is barely comprehensible. Luckily, the international community has learned its lessons from this era to never repeat the same horrendous mistakes, haven't we? Oh my god, now I'm recording this in like late 2022. And it's like, you know, there's vague talk you know is putin gonna press the button is he gonna use those nukes and it's like probably not it's very unlikely but for the first time like i can't imagine living back in the time of like the cuban missile crisis stuff it's like that must be so intense that it's like and of course nuclear war could be possible today and all of that but it's like less likely but now with like this ukraine russia stuff going on it's like mm, and i live quite close to there it's like mm. <laughs> i guess it's 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 obviously not the same it's not the same level of danger or anything but it's probably the closest we've come since like the the 60s right which is kind of a, where was cuban missile crisis 63 kennedy dealt with it right so he was still alive so maybe it was 60 62 something like that now of course these booms were not explosions in the strict sense a bombardment by foreign powers was not a mainstream interpretation of these events especially since there was no visible destruction to bell island or the surrounding area we all know the cold war never turned into a hot war though this is obviously a statement only possible in hindsight even back in the day the idea of these booms originating from natural acts of warfare seemed a little far-fetched nevertheless the specter of war eclipsed the ruminations if the ominous sounds were not related to military attacks then perhaps to american weapon experiments that's exactly what i think it would be like it's definitely people testing weapons like up in the atmosphere or underwater or something like that similar but underwater could be a good one that feels like a nuclear bomb going off underwater would like it wouldn't violate that test ban treaty right against atmospheric testing you wouldn't have to bury it super underground they're probably also interested what happens when you blow something up a blow a nuclear bomb underwater because you know they were kind of interested ones when you blow up a nuclear bomb on the moon people were interested in all sorts of shit <laughs> um this seems like the first early thoughts it could be possibly that this is the sort of thing that could be like declassified in a few years and you find out what it actually is which i love similar reports were made from other places along the north american east coast the booms have been heard as far away as continental newfoundland or nova scotia and occasionally even citizens of florida complained about the nighttime disturbances isn't that really far away oh no newfoundland and nova scotia are on the east coast right and florida is also east coast but really far down i think no, I know where Florida is. I just don't know where Nova Scotia is. Newfoundland must be on the East Coast because it's called Newfoundland. That must be like one of the first places, right? That makes sense. That's East Coast. People would describe a thunder-like blast that would quickly mutate into a low-pitched trombone tone, powerful enough to make your chest vibrate. Accounts often specified the lack of direction from where the sound originated, as at times it felt like you were downright encircled by the acoustic source, as if the sky itself had turned into a colossal subwoofer for a few seconds witnesses on or close to bell islands would often include yet another oddity according to some it didn't always stop with the acoustics sometimes the booms were accompanied by luminous orbs that graced the night sky for a short time and then disappeared again like glowing monster eyes hastening a brief glimpse from the clouds the rumors about the booms of bell islands were so pervasive that they eventually reached the ears of the u.s military they were quick to deny any involvement since the u.s air force obviously had no business in canadian airspace nevertheless then u.s president jimmy carter himself announced an immediate investigation into the occurrences by the american department of defense which to some seems like a surprisingly intense reaction i don't know it's like there are booms happening off the coast of like our neighboring country during a time of very high international tensions and if he's got something to do with it this would be if he's not got something to do with it he's going to want to find out what those booms are and if he does have something to do with it he's going to want to pretend to want to find out what those booms are so this seems like a kind of reasonable response to me up to this point the reports were vague hearsay say sure even a handful of well-known scientists had drawn attention to the phenomenon by now but the same goes for bigfoot and fairies uh does it well-known scientists drawing attention to fairies dennis I'd like to know what source you got on that one. <laughs> Neither of these issues had ever triggered a presidential reaction. We must look into the fairies immediately. Imagine if Joe Biden went on camera tomorrow and announced a military intelligence operation because some Bible Belt wackos reported a couple of Mothman sightings. It would raise some eyebrows, wouldn't it? The Department of Defense assigned the task to its Naval Research Board, which delivered a detailed report after a suspiciously short amount of time. According to their findings, the boom noises had a fairly obvious cause. The researchers were able to establish a link between the locations of the reports and the flight paths of some supersonic civilian planes. 
supersonic civilian planes. There is only one supersonic civilian plane, Concorde. So it's got to be Concorde flying over there. I guess Conk did, but there wouldn't be a boom. That was the whole point. They weren't booming over land because that would disturb people. This is a silly explanation. This particularly applied to the now retired Concorde aircraft, which at the time shuttled between Great Britain and the US East Coast, passing right through the area in question. Planes of this class produced a tremendous bang when breaking the sound barrier, and thus the mystery was cracked for good. Really? It's like the booms were enormous and. Is this going to be so regular? And I don't think they were booming over land. And are we going to match this up with the time they were heard with when Conkor was passing over? Because there needs to be more looked into than this, guys. This is a very weak investigation, making me think that maybe you're responsible for those old booms. And yeah, it's Concord for sure. And people be like, well, we looked up the flight path of Concord and it wasn't. It was Concord! Shut up! Or prison! This explanation seems exceedingly coherent, and I'm sure this was your first thought as well. Um. <laughs> you were too confident then, Dennis. The report's findings were especially underpinned by the fact that they not only shed light on the problem, but they also directly announced a possible solution. Only a slight adjustment in flight paths could largely eliminate the nuisance, since the moment of breaking the sound barrier would then occur at a much greater distance from the coastline, so the commercial airlines adjusted their schedules accordingly. And indeed, the stories of the boons thinned out abruptly. Holy shit! I guess I was wrong, although this were like a third of the way through the episode, so I guess I'm not wrong entirely. Most affected areas were completely relieved of their nighttime scares, and in the remaining regions, the volume dropped to a tolerable level. You can't argue with the results, can you? Well, color me, uh, color me wrong. Is that a phrase? <laughs> Well, you absolutely can, and this story hasn't reached its climax by far. Excellent. <laughs> I like being right. What I told you? You see, the government's analysis did provide a plausible answer, but the gaps in it immediately jumped out at some people. Folks of Bell Island weren't exactly living in modern times, but they weren't completely out of touch with reality either. The theory of a supersonic aircraft had obviously occurred to them, but to their logic, it was not conclusive. To be fair, it was feasible to trace the geographical relationship between the booms and the flight paths, but the timing was largely mismatched for several reasons. First and foremost, while the booms were mostly heard at night, civil air traffic peaked during the day. Yeah, exactly. No, like you've got to check this out. Make sure it all lines up and shit. Moreover, careful observers across the coast had independently noticed the lack of booms on particularly important holidays such as Christmas or Independence Day. Yet Concord routes were heavily operated at these times. This is just making me think it's the military testing shit again because they're not operating. They're not doing like tests on Independence Day. They're not like setting off fireworks and having a barbecue. It's America. Christmas. They're at home with their families. This makes perfect sense. Just be like, we were okay, we were blowing up nuclear weapons in the ocean. Fine. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. The official version did not address this fact in any way, although this has always been a central part of the public discourse. Foreign powers, aliens, or natural phenomena would not have cared about American holidays. But secret services probably would. But the Americans probably would, exactly. However, this was not the only aspect conveniently omitted. What about the glowing spheres in the night sky that supposedly accompanied the blast? A connection to supersonic air travel was near impossible to draw, as sonic booms do not give off any light, especially not stationary semi-magic bubbles. It also didn't help that the Naval Research Board of all institutions spearheaded the effort. This is because their purview also included a wide range of military experiments and weapons testing, which, again, had been a prime suspect in popular speculation all along. Certain circles instantly fell under the impression that the NRB's so-called investigations were ultimately a cover-up of their own classified and presumably unethical doings. Despite these somewhat valid objections, the excitement quickly died down over the subsequent days. For most people, the matter was settled. After all, the proposed fix had achieved the promised effect. Out of sight, out of mind. There was no shortage of other topics that could easily push themselves to the forefront of concerns. But as people were soon to find out, the booms would go with a bang. Chapter 2 a mild case of doomsday. The calm before the storm lasted barely two weeks. On April the 2nd, 1978, at 11 o'clock to the second, the sky above Bell Island lit up with a brilliant flash of untold brightness, followed by a deafening blare like a godlike force ripped through the sky unlike anything seen or heard before. The subsequent shockwave spread at least 50 kilometers, uprooting trees and tearing buildings apart, killing animals and injuring people. Yep, okay, anyone being like, I don't know if they're hearing those booms, those booms even really, it's like, oh, it's bright. 
bro, look at the trees. Have you seen the damage? And this just makes me, there's a couple of things here that make me think military experiments again. I mean, I'm so, I'm pretty sure it's military experiments. You gotta be sure as well, right? No one's listening to this and being like, yeah, it's not the military. It's the military. Two things. One, 11 o'clock on the dot. If that was Concorde flying over, they don't time Concorde's booms for a specific time. They're just like, Concorde takes off at a specific time and then it booms at like 11.03 and 30 seconds or whatever. 11 o'clock on the dot, someone pressed a button. Someone had a scheduled detonation for that time. And also, I'm thinking experimental weapons because like nuclear bombs and stuff. What was it? Castle? Was it Castle Bravo? The one that was famously much bigger than they expected. It just went perfectly and it ended up just devastating like an island chain or something. God, that's Castle Bravo, right? It was supposed to be small, it ends up being a massive explosion because they didn't quite know how it all worked yet. Well, they were quite like tuning in like how powerful nuclear bombs were. So I think they just accidentally set off a ripper of a nuclear bomb underwater. <laughs> Residents from the coastal mainland watched in horror as the distant isle was to all appearances entirely annihilated by a blast outgrowing its own contours. After the first moments of shock had passed, the emergency services phone lines were running hot. However, because Bell Island was sparsely populated, most callers reported from the surrounding coastal regions. As a result, there was some initial confusion among authorities as to where Ground Zero was located, just as they failed to comprehend the magnitude of the disaster at first. Officials took a while to assemble the puzzle pieces into a somewhat coherent picture, though up to this day, the task has not been fully completed. While people on the outskirts of the affected perimeter initially assumed a natural event, such as a particularly violent lightning strike, people in the closer latitudes were quickly convinced to have faced anything but natural spectacles. Not only did they complain about a roar that nearly ruptured their eardrums, several testimonies bizarrely reported a column of light descending from the clouds, touching down on Bell Island just as the explosion unfolded its devastating rage. A couple observing the scene from St. Philip's even managed to trump this retelling, as their account added an even brighter sphere passing through the light column like a magic elevator car going down a radiant shaft. Once Bell Island had been pinpointed as the epicenter, its seclusion came to an end instantly. Within hours, the island was swarmed with investigators, including both local police officers and media reporters. If I was one of those people, I'd be like, boys, we've got a Geiger counter, right? <laughs> click, click, click. Let's be careful. <laughs> So let's briefly break this down to a common denominator. Two weeks after the smaller and distant nighttime explosion subsided, Bell Island had suffered a direct hit by yet another explosion. But this one had been more powerful by orders of magnitude. As a matter of fact, the booms became the boom, as everything previous paled next to the newest event, and therefore were no longer worthy of the title. Also, it would be the last one to ever occur, so to avoid any confusion, let's label the incidents before April the 2nd the pops going forward. This this term has never been widely used, but it's a fun word to say, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> I like it. Generally speaking, we can paint a rather credible picture of what happened immediately after the boom, just as we can venture fairly reliable assertions about the investigations that followed. Since the harbingers of the latest explosion had already captivated people's attention for months, public interest in this sudden burst of escalation was consequently immense. The media coverage was extensive, and there was no shortage of eyewitnesses readily available to newspapers and television stations. I'm super curious as to what this is. Like, I think this... Di I mean, the underwater nuclear stuff, I was kind of like, that's, you know, that seems pretty reasonable, right? I think everyone... That, I feel like people listening would be like, it's a reasonable assumption, Simon, well done. Um, but now I'm like, this seems like this island was targeted by something, which is weird. Like, could it be unrelated? Could it be this was like a meteor dropping down, but then there'd be a crater and everything, or like, it would be slightly different, right? It just seems very weird that this... It seems very weird. I'm very curious. I don't have a good explanation or any real thoughts to a good explanation yet. The first reports, which had been received from a radius within some 50 kilometers, were not only strikingly numerous, but also remarkably similar among themselves, with only slight variations in detail. We know, for instance, of a metallic haze that lingered in the air several hours after the boom, as if tiny particles of iron or copper had trickled down from the clouds. According to other accounts, the metallic taste seemed instead to have risen from the ground, as if a gigantic magnet had extracted it from the pores of the soil. Across the entire area, people spoke of glowing orbs floating around just like those which have preceded the pops but so far it has always been a maximum of one glowing orb per pop this time a whole swarm had befallen the lands like an electrically supercharged plague of locusts only to vanish into thin air in a few seconds Despite the unanimous description of utmost ferocity the event did not claim any human lives which is a bit of a surprise based on holy shit really 
So you saw a massive explosion that blew down trees. I guess there wasn't everyone, anyone on the island. I mean, there was very few people on the island, but it's still lucky they survived. Based on what transpired on this Sunday morning, the previous pop seemed like firecrackers. You'd imagine that an explosion of this magnitude would have wiped out the island completely, but this couldn't be further from the truth. Of course, there was no lack of visible damage, which we'll get to in a moment, yet the region had not transformed into a post-apocalyptic wasteland of ashes either. When the first ferry moored after the boom, firefighters, medics, and journalists were met with a bizarre sight. Presumably, they had expected to find an enormous crater, with people screaming in panic among smoldering embers and piles of corpses. They had imagined themselves in the middle of a battle zone, with a raging inferno on one side and a lake of magma on the other, a scene of devastation in which the survivors would be begging for medical care, water, supplies. Yet all they found were slightly bruised villagers cleaning up dirt and clutter in a state of mild confusion. What appeared to be a magically enchanted atomic sci-fi bomb to both outside observers and nuclear monitoring satellites was merely a medium-sized inconvenience to most people located directly on Bell Island. Injuries were limited to relatively benign matters such as concussions and bruises, with the occasional first-degree burn from electric shocks, though I'm sure quite a few mental wounds would have been noted had the science of psychology not been a bit of a joke in the 1970s. Damage to the buildings was far more obvious, even though this fell short of apprehensions as well. Some houses showed large and suspiciously circular holes, as if cartoon pirates had fired their cannons at the island. One shed had been completely torn apart, leaving nothing behind but a pile of cinders. In the streets, the wild chickens could be found everywhere, all dead, with blood pouring from their beaks and eyes. Oh no, it's an anti-chicken weapon. <laughs> Poor chickens. Cook them up quickly, though. When longtime Bell Island resident Edward Bennett was interviewed for a CBC television segment a few years later, he was one of many who gave a first hand account of what happened that dire day. For him, the events had come without any warning. According to his narration, he had just sat down for a rather early lunch with his aging black and white telly running in the background, and all hell broke loose. And visual artifacts on the television, to which he did not to which he didn't attach huge importance. In the age of analog data transmission, such annoyances had to be put up with on an everyday basis, especially when living on an island. But when the screen began to glow like a headlight, he instantly grew concerned that something was awry. Oh my god, yeah, I just remembered like tuning televisions. I remember like you'd go onto a channel. Is this is this just me? Am I that old? Like people must have had this, right? You you go onto a channel like channel three or whatever, and it would be a bit fuzzy and be like, oh no, television needs a little bit of retuning. And you could go into like the tuning section and adjust it until the picture was clear. Like, <laughs> the past was terrible. Netflix is amazing. But when the screen began to glow like a headlight, he instantly grew concerned that something was awry. Yet before he could react in any way, he felt an electric tension surging through the air, which conjured a sizzling noise from behind the walls in every direction and left him struggling to breathe. When the clock struck 11, the TV exploded with a shower of glass and sparks as an invisible force knocked Mr. Bennett to the ground. Although he felt like a thousand suns had exploded straight up inside his parlor, he did not allow himself to lose consciousness while straightening up. This is beginning to sound a bit more like an experiment with an EMP, right? You know those things that knock out electricity, uh, electrical devices. Do they make them blow up? That's just in the movies, right? But it sounds like maybe this was somewhere between a bomb and an EMP and like a non-radiation explosion that doesn't really hurt people but just sends a shockwave along with that. It's sounding like an experimental weapon, isn't it? That's and if I if we don't get a result an, an answer in today's episode, which I don't think we will because I feel like we'd know. I think it's the military playing around with experimental weapons. For sure. As the bang faded as quickly as it came, Mr. Bennett was basically shell-shocked and battled dizziness and disorientation for minutes. Yet he could clearly make out the blue beams of light shining into his apartment through the power outlets, throwing sparks onto his carpet. After what could have been a couple of milliseconds or half an eternity, he dragged himself out onto the street completely exhausted. But apart from that, he made it through the incident without any injuries. Mr. Bennett was far from the only one to tell of electronics gone haywire. Blown fuses, flickering lights, burning sockets, and broken TVs accompanied the boom in other households as well. This episode has pretty much turned into a bootleg script of a cancelled Stranger Things spin-off by now. If this wasn't a retelling of true events, it might be very close to straight-up plagiarism at this point. <laughs> Bell Island is roughly nine kilometers across, with damages accreting the further north you go. If you had to put a pin into each damaged building on a map and strung a red thread between them like a lunatic conspiracy theorist, they would have converged on a small piece of farmland owned by James 
Bickford, who went by the name Jim for the most part. Before the rescue workers arrived at his property, they certainly juggled trivial explanations. Perhaps a gasoline depot had caught a spark. Some chemical fertilizers were also known to react very nastily to accidental ignition. However, all these approaches were thrown out the window when they laid eyes on Mr. Bickford's abode, as they were now irrevocably caught inside a science fiction novel. Immediately after crossing the doorstep, they were met with a sickening stench capable of making even a seasoned first responder vomit. This odor came not from the electrical wires in the walls being completely scorched, but also from the surrounding rubber insulation, which had melted into a black, foamy substance that oozed from the wall paneling. There is that that acrid, burning rubber smell. It's like it's not it's not going to make me wretch, but it is like a smell that gets into your nose and into the back of your throat and in your lungs, and you're just like you're just like smelling that burning rubber, being like, I know this is like I know. I just bumped up my odds of getting lung cancer by like two percent from just that that little situation there it's like why why is that on fire don't be burning that rubber the only task of such insulation is obviously to contain the electrical charge the energy required to melt the same material is just inconceivable any appliance with a plug batteries or even transistors had practically crumbled to dust the fuse box had detonated with such force that its individual parts had penetrated the opposite wall like shrapnel so it sounds like a massive electricity overload so this is some sort of weapon that can like and just blast something with it energy that would just cause it to, to melt and that's a real thing right that's a real thing that can happen i think <laughs> sometimes i wonder about things that i've read and things i've seen in movies <laughs> but this feels real unfortunately Big mr bigford himself had no clear recollection of the blast his episodic memory suspended at exactly 11 o'clock and it didn't resume its service until quite a few minutes later when he suddenly found himself on the parquet floor yet both his dazzled eyes and the ringing in his ears indicated that there must have been some kind of explosion so he immediately pulled himself together as he hastily staggered onto the porch he had expected the island to be flattened to the ground but once his pupils focused he found himself on a peaceful sunday morning as if nothing at all had happened only at second glance did he discover three holes in his drive Driveway, which would later pose great mysteries to investigators as well they were about an arm's length wide and deep and though there was no evidence of their origin the, the cavities held no comets that might have impacted or anything else such as crashed aircraft parts space debris or residue of any explosives the soil was also nowhere to be found it had vanished from the grounds in an unknown way neither was it scattered around the holes nor was it piled up anywhere it's as if it had simply decided to stop existing then he noticed something else was amiss behind his cabin mr bigford had attended a small chicken coop with some two dozen hens of course you'd have assumed a wild clucking given the turmoil but dead silence reigned instead the barn had buckled a bit on one side but it was no been collapsed and therefore it was accessible upon inspecting he realized his livestock had indeed turned to dead stock his chickens lay lifeless in puddles of blood which had oozed from all their orifices but far from being dead the animals were apparently in perfect shape there were no visible burns broken bones bruised feathers or other visible injuries we'll come back to this later though yeah it's kind of crazy that because you think like an emp or whatever it would do all the electrics whatever let's assume that's possible but then this killed the birds but it didn't kill the people that's super weird while mr bickford was still struggling to make sense of his findings his son darren raced onto the premises he flung his bike to the ground as soon as he spotted his father barely able to put his thoughts in order coincidentally darren had been a stoned throw from the impact site when the boom erupted and making him the key witness of today's story though keep in mind he was merely 12 years old at the time a stage of development often tending towards fanciful flourishes not to say tall tales i'll leave the verdict on his credibility to you leading up to the boom darren was riding his bike aimlessly through the surrounding landscape as it frequently do on his days off from school he was a short stretch from his home when he suddenly noticed the hairs on his arm standing up the electrical cackle made itself felt in the air as the island brightened unnaturally he closed his eyes for a moment in an attempt to shield his aching retinas but when he cautiously peeked through his fingers he found himself in a direct encounter with a glowing orb hovering just feet above the ground the sphere did not seem material but like pure energy swirling, swirling around a center point with blue swirls that disappeared and reappeared in their own folds as a child of the cold war he immediately thought of numerous psa's regarding nuclear bombs which the government had repeatedly spread throughout the years though his descriptions more in line with a biblical description of an angel than a warhead darren bravely returned the orb's gaze even though he was shaking with terror while both his father and mr bennett were slammed to the grounds by an invisible fist at around this moment darren remained utterly unharmed throughout the whole ordeal the sphere faded into nothingness with a raucous whoosh as if darren had suddenly awakened from a horrible daydream yes i know elizabeth on a bicycle encounters the mysterious mysterious phenomenon head-on yet remains completely unharmed still it's still not stranger things fact fiction i swear <laughs> 
As we had previously noted, the regional task forces were initially overwhelmed by the situation, even if there was a diffuse awareness that something beyond day-to-day -day business had occurred. Though the first responders provided helpful insights into the initial situation, the actual investigation didn't begin until the following day. Chapter 3 The Much Bigger Picture at the time of the boom, a swarm of surveillance satellites from the U.S. American VELA program hovered around 100,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Their aim was to monitor compliance with the Partial Test Ban Treaty from 1963. Thus, they were constantly on the lookout for unusually bright spots anywhere on the globe. The VELA satellites had a diameter of only 3 meters, but were equipped with hypersensitive detection devices which could spot a nuclear explosion, even if it was taking place underwater. So when Bell Island residents experienced the scare of their lives on the morning of April 2, 1960, they shared it with U.S. agents stationed at the ground base. The VELA program was known to flag false positives occasionally, for instance, in connection with interfering solar flares. Yet when a flash of light was measured near the North American coast, which was brighter than anything they'd ever seen, lunch break is probably over. Apart from the very first second, federal authorities likely didn't suspect they were literally dealing with a sudden nuclear strike, as an intercontinental missile of this size would have shown up on multiple other surveillance systems as well. Yet they were among the first to realize that something huge had taken place, which set various protocols in motion. What happened backstage is obviously a well-kept secret, but there was presumably some sort of consultation with the Canadian authorities to determine further proceedings. National security was not directly endangered, leaving ample time for jurisdictional limbo. Yeah, I mean, this is like a secret still, but it was 1970s. Surely, when, when does stuff like that? They, they declassify stuff after a certain period for most stuff, right? So it's fairly reasonable to assume we're going to get something declassified around this right now and get a fairly reasonable explanation. It's always like slightly disappointing. <laughs> you're like, oh, it's going to be awesome. It's like, no, it's just an experimental weapon that turns out to be a bit shit. And you're like, okay, how does it work? Oh, I was like, oh, something close between a nuclear bomb and a uh, an EMP pulse. Okay, <laughs> it's always the how, how does it go? Like, it's always the most boring explanation. Occam's razor. Like, it's always the, the simplest thing is usually correct. It's not aliens. It's not wizards it's just the military testing bombs the canadian government went first with their investigations and sent out scientists the following day the researchers turned the island upside down collected soil samples inspected damage to electrical grids photographed every square millimeter and consulted with weather stations and geological research institutes yet they were astonishingly disinterested in what the locals had to report. They refrained from any interaction with residents unless absolutely necessary, and they hardly asked any questions and pretty much limited themselves to their scientific instruments. But to be fair, they were not investigators. They were chemists, physicists, meteorologists, and their accompanying lab assistants. Yeah, but I feel like people's first-hand observations of it are still going to be interesting to you, even if you are like more interested in you know the, the hard science of it. They're still like, what did it look like? No, unless you had a camera, that's the next best thing you've got is like someone's observation of it. You thought the thing they'd be slightly more interested. So there's not necessarily anything mysterious about their secretive approach. If I had been in charge of the research, I would have prioritized the scientific method over listening to random ramblings as well. Yes, totally, it should be prioritized. But also, what's the harm in asking for like some eyewitness testimony? I, I know eyewitness testimony kind of sucks, but it'd be good, you know, that's there's not a lot of other stuff to measure. There's no cameras and stuff, so go for it. Despite their lack of attention towards humans, though, the Canadians seemed to be obsessed with the dead chickens. Before turning their backs on the island again, they had collected every single specimen of the dead poultry, and they took absolutely no joke in this matter, as if they operated a strict no-chicken-left-behind policy. To this day, it remains a mystery whether there was something special about the dead creatures, or if the scientists had just craved a snack for their crossing back to the mainland. Who knows? It's not the snack thing, Dennis. That's gross. They'd probably be a little bit off by then. It's a day later, and... Uh, gonna cook those chickens what's up i know it's a joke i'm just taking it too far after the canadians had left bell island their government didn't linger for long on pesky busy work such as having their findings peer reviewed instead they chose to present their conclusions to the public in a snap as you could deduce from the existence of this video they didn't exactly convince everyone their report was grounded on two central key assertions of which especially the second one is a little hard to believe first of all they assumed the earlier pops bore no relation to the boom wait the second one's hard to believe i'm like <laughs> <laughs> I I would be very surprised. To be precise, they wholeheartedly sided with the NRB's stance regarding the Concorde flight paths, which, despite the similar symptoms, had been an entirely separate phenomenon that the US government had been able to both explain and resolve. Although, I don't think they did that very adequately, to be honest. Concerning the explosion on Bell Island, that had been so-called ball lightning. 
Now, those are worthy of their own episode of Decoding the Unknown, but worry not, I'll keep things short. The existence of ball lightning is highly debated up to this day and is widely considered to be as hypothetical as time travel and teleportation. Yeah, okay, so it's not real. Time travel's not real. <laughs> We know that. In theory, the expression describes a type of plasmatic cloud that appears as a growing sphere during a thunderstorm. Ball lightning typically ranges in size from a tennis ball to a car and can last for several seconds to a minute, according to those who believe in their existence. Despite its name, they're not normally related to your everyday lightning. Regular lightning is a spark of electricity that occurs when the atmosphere gets charged from opposing air currents leading up to a sudden discharge. Ball lightning, on the other hand, is thought to be caused by a strong electric field ionizing the air and forming a highly energetic vapor of loose electrons and nuclei. Such a phenomena has never been produced under laboratory conditions, nor has it been credibly observed in nature, which is why the subject is by and large considered to be the domain of science fiction literature. This flaw serves as an invitation to reject the statement altogether. In essence, the Canadian government had explained one mysterious occurrence with another, even more dubious one, thereby merely shifting the question one lick up in the causal chain. They could have attributed the event to the wrath of Zeus as well. I mean, it would fully explain the boom, albeit at the cost of some new questions emerging. Yeah, we can completely discount that, because ball lightning has no basis in scientific facts, so pff, discounted, it wasn't that. Even the thing about the Concord booms, I'm like, come on. Canadians, make an effort. Come on, at least come up with something halfway believable. This is unbelievable. Even from the standpoint of 2022, it's a safe bet to label ball lightning as utter nonsense. I'm certainly aware of two very popular YouTube videos claiming to show one, but seriously, provide me with half an hour of time and a trial version of Adobe After Effects, and I'll happily add a third one to the pool of evidence. Vociferous objections emerge not only from the prepper bunkers of weirdos wearing tinfoil hats, but also from the realm of serious academics. Yet, despite everything, the Canadian state would not back down an inch from its original declaration, with the US authorities nodding in agreement. Oh yes, you gonna be like, yes, 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 it was definitely that ball lightning. Canada, you're bang on! <laughs> you big brains over in Canada! <laughs> Meanwhile, they're like, wow, can't believe people bought that shit. Ball lightning? <laughs> ah, as a matter of fact, the US institutions found this account to be so incredibly convincing that they relaunched their own investigation the very next day, just to make sure. So, it was now the turn of the US to engage in detective games, and boy did they deliver. In the CBC piece I mentioned earlier, one of the local firefighters portrayed the federal agents with perceptible reluctance. He spoke of taciturn men dressed in dark suits, well-mannered, extremely polite, yet inhumanly aloof and somewhat disconnected. You cannot have a story like this without the men in black hanging around, can you? While they arrived in the company of scientists as well, those gave off different vibes entirely. They hadn't been geeky nerds in lab coats, but personnel from Los Alamos, the government research institute responsible for the birth of nuclear warfare, among other horrors beyond human comprehension. They all <laughs> beyond human comprehension. <laughs> It's like, uh, uh, nuclear bombs might be complicated, biological warfare might be complicated, but it's not beyond my comprehension. I can comprehend that it's horrible. They also brought along Canadian military, presumably to lend their investigation some legitimacy, as they were technically operating on foreign soil. The Canadian military came up with the idea of ball lightning. Please, legitimate. Ridiculous. <laughs> Bell Island villagers rapidly realized that the efforts of the U.S. feds would prove much more intense and serious. Unlike their Canadian counterparts, they were invested in every piece of evidence imaginable. They conducted extensive interrogations with anyone who might have seen or heard anything, though they did not assert any pressure on those who refused to partake. They would put all sorts of items in lockable steel crates and ship them off the island, yet they would not seize anything without the express permission of the original owner. Given the demand for an answer, most were more than willing to cooperate, though. Then again, not everyone welcomes the men in black with open arms. According to some accounts, there was now something uncanny and surreal about the whole affair, as if the agents were not really interested in finding a truth that they didn't already know, but were merely going through the motions of investigating while actually collecting samples for later scientific study. The vague gut feeling certainly didn't diminish once the second wave of investigators had departed Bell Island as well, taking with them all of their equipment, but also leaving behind a lot of unanswered questions. During the following months, the US agencies maintained a very elusive attitude towards the press. While the Canadians have been overly enthusiastic about sharing their, let's call it, bindings, the Americans remained tight-lipped. They would not release any scientific papers, nor would they comment on their investigation in general, thus leaving the Gordian knot for us to solve. Chapter 4. It Wasn't Aliens 
No, really it wasn't. Beams of light touching down from the skies, with animals dropping dead and humans staying behind in confusion, this story does provide all of the ingredients for an instant Hollywood classic. Yet keep in mind, actual aliens are union mandated to attack only New York and Washington, D.C. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so the, 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 the aliens don't attack Los Angeles. Why not? That's where all the movies, like, that's where all the movie studios are and stuff, right? Lots of TV shows are set there. I see it because it's cheaper because then people don't have to move around the country. Although now they film it in other places like New Mexico and stuff because of like tax incentives, right? Wasn't that why Breaking Bad was filmed like in New Mexico? There was that whole story about how originally it was going to be set in like Los Angeles and then they moved it to New Mexico or whatever and it just gave the whole show a different vibe. And I'm like, I don't know, Breaking Bad was so good. That really worked out. Let's also skip any other paranormal or fringe angles for the moment, as there's already enough to unravel without making things intentionally more complicated. This isn't called encoding the unknown, though I can see myself binge watching a new channel with Simon completely explaining scientific concepts, only to follow it up with this is, this is complete bullshit because it was ghosts. It's like, in this video, how gravity works. Let's look at Newton's laws, which are bullshit because we know it's ghosts. Come on now. Oh god, ghosts, come on now. Let's start small then. I think there's no denying that both the pops and the booms, in fact, did happen one way or another. Yes, often in Dakota the Unknown, it's like the actual I event that the very that the entire video is about just never actually happened, and it was written about some dude who just called it fact when it was entirely fiction. So that's one base covered. Regarding the pops, sources for this sequence of events are numerous and mostly robust. Even an actual president has taken a stand on it, so we can confidently assume that it had been more than just hysteria and contagious imagination. As to the boom, I think that the whole Vela satellite thing counts as irrefutable proof, not to mention the countless eyewitness testimonies. Yeah, not to mention the incredible amount of damage on the island and the dead chickens and all of this stuff. This definitely happens. I'm like, and I'm like, I need evidence. I need evidence. This is uh, enough. <laughs> Some of those people in the comments are like, Simon, when's enough for you? One belt's not enough. Two belt's not enough. Three belt's not enough. Four belt's not enough. And I'm like, well, look, here's a line. There we go. Boom. This is enough. I'm convinced by this. It really happens. What it was, don't know. Was it supernatural? No, obviously not. I need more evidence of that. A lot more that will never be provided. Because <laughs> it's not real. Now, one of the pivotal questions that we have to tackle is whether the pops and the boom were even connected, as our chosen opinion on the matter allows for an entirely different narrative down the line. For the islanders, this linkage was self-evident. For somewhat valid reasons, both events shared extremely specific commonalities, glowing orbs, thunderous sounds, and lack of proper explanations. A few pages ago, I roughly outlined why Concord jets had held little appeal as a cause, though I refrain from evaluating these objections. We need to catch up on that right now. For example, critics noted that the booms were much more present at night, though air traffic is usually in a lull after sunset. While this argument does sound good on paper, let me introduce you to my godforsaken fridge three rooms down. This piece of trash has been depriving me of sleep for months with its gurgling and humming. Every night when I lie in bed with my eyes closed, this little bugger thuds a trillion decibels directly into my eardrums. <laughs> yeah, fridges could get really loud. Do you know they're quiet, quiet. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> wakey, wakey, bitch! <laughs> What is that? Is that when that cooler kicks on, right? Or the motor or whatever it is. <laughs> Yet during the day, with the sounds of everyday life blowing through the window and me being occupied with this and that, I don't notice it in the slightest, which is why I forget about buying a new one every single day. Do you see what I'm getting at? The same argument probably goes for most holidays, as I imagine people living in Newfoundland would then engage in typical, typical Newfoundland activities such as drinking rum or drinking rum. I didn't know Newfoundland was a big rum drinking place. I kind of imagine it's cold and they're more like cocoa drinking rather than like rum drinking, which, I don't know, where's rum? Like, I imagine Caribbean drinking a lot of rum. Just like chilling out down there, drinking some rum on the beach in a cocktail of some variety, having a good time. I went to Cuba. They drink a lot of rum in Cuba. It's kind of nice. Kind of like rum. I didn't used to like rum because when I was a kid, it was like, what was rum? It's like Bacardi Breezer or whatever. Not Bacardi Breezer. That's the, the, the alcopop made with it. Bacardi. It's just Bacardi rum. And it's horrible. And Captain Morgan's also horrible. And then I discovered a friend of mine from uh, Puerto Rico was like, dude, there are nice rums. And he told me about all these nice rums. And I'm like, oh, these are really good. <laughs> Thank you. I think we can also account for the glowing orbs by applying a little bit of Occam's razor. You see, despite the scary narrative of conspiracy theorists, Concord jets actually do glow pretty darn bright. They're powered by two impressive combustion jet engines, which emit a long beam of fire each, just like a king-size blowtorch. Combine this with multiple navigation lights and a little blur from clouds and haze, and there you go. You've made yourself a spooky glowing orb. Any bright light will appear roughly spherical given enough distance and contrast it's an optical illusion called irradiation you can look it up 
Oh, okay. I'm coming around. Like at first, I was like, "These are, too, you know, earlier you were here. <laughs> you listened to this. You even listened to this episode." I was like, "I think they're related. They're definitely related." And coming around to the fact that maybe it was Concord and maybe they aren't related. I think I've changed my opinion a little bit on this one as more evidence has been presented, which is the thing that everyone should do because it's good. Change your opinion when evidence is presented. Let's go. Still on the fence? Let's recall again how effective the flight path changes were. For me, that was already a dead giveaway. Using a great deal of fantasy, one might assume the Pops were actually something sinister and secret, so the evil government ended their wrongdoings at the same time they forced airliners to change their flight paths. This way, they could make everyone confuse correlation with causation, or in different words, changing the flight paths didn't do anything, they just ceased their top-secret operation simultaneously. But if this had been the case, then why continue two weeks later in the most obvious way possible? This idea requires too many absurd presumptions to be taken seriously. Yeah, it did vaguely enter my mind that they ceased it at the same time to cover it up earlier, but it does seem a bit of a stretch, doesn't it? I agree with Dennis. In this respect, I'm not ashamed to out myself as a sheep, or as far as the pops are concerned, I see little substantial reason to doubt the explanation of civil jet engines breaking the sound barrier, though you're invited to challenge my reasoning in the comments. I'm not going to challenge it. I think you persuaded me, Dennis. Well done. And he it. Good job. And yeah, being a sheep, being a sheeple, is like don't don't be a contrarian like people always are like, oh, sheep or you believe the, the the obvious explanation it's like yeah well you're a contrarian just like the most common explanation is usually the correct one because that's what most people think <sighs> fucking conspiracy theory people drive me nuts man it's crazy but let's go on the position that we are indeed dealing with two fundamentally different mysteries allowing us to consider one as resolved and devote our attention to the other put on your dear stalker hats and light your tobacco pipes ladies and gentlemen as this is where the fun begins we have so many details and clues at our hands surely some arrangement must harbor the revelation when viewed at just the right angle spoiler alert i failed oh no yeah i got the feeling this one doesn't have a happy like a happy ending a uh um, not a happy ending, but like a satisfying conclusion. Still, here are some thoughts of mine as some sort of input for your own reflections. There's one particular question that I've been asking myself throughout the entire research process, yet I still feel uncertain about. Just how big an explosion was the boom? I tried to stay faithful to sources, though I cannot deny the discrepancy between the colossal descriptions and the actual damage it left behind. I don't know about you, but for me, it doesn't quite add up. How can a detonation uproot trees, but at the same time barely deform a wooden chicken coop right next to ground zero? So, here's a fun little experiment that you can try yourself. Grab a flashlight and sneak up on any person from behind. Now, now turn it on and spotlight the back of the unsuspecting test subject. Are they screaming in pain? Probably not. All right, now switch the flashlight off again and smack it over your over their head with all their strength. What would their reaction be? Something along the lines of, ouch, what the hell? Don't do this. Don't do this. You'll get in trouble. Well, thank you for participating, as this very scientific field study proves it, provides us with an important insight. Brightness does not equal violence, and violence does not equal brightness. Sure, the boom had given off more light than the bombing of Hiroshima. This is true beyond any reasonable doubt, yet this does not necessarily mean it was even remotely as powerful. Unfortunately, though, the Vela measurement is the only objective calibration unit by which we can estimate the scaling. Apart from that, it's all verbal reports from eyewitnesses, which have been in both mental and electrical shock while being completely blindsided by the flash. Of course, radiation and kinetic energy are related when it comes to things going boom, yet this relationship is anything but linear. So instead of talking about an incredibly huge detonation, we might be talking about a medium-sized one which just happened to be extremely bright. Though I'm sure chemists watching this video are completely furious right now, as I've probably gotten it completely wrong. I should have consulted an expert or two, but unfortunately I couldn't be bothered. <laughs> well, that's what the comment section's for. Come on, armchair chemists or real chemists, let's go! And speaking of unreliable narratives, here are my two cents on 12 year old Darren's testimony. It's probably rubbish, isn't it? Now, I used to work as a high school teacher, so here's the thing I can guarantee to exist teens making up random stories to garner attention. <laughs> yes. Children, it's what they do. On the other hand, here's the thing whose existence is a bit of a stretch the Eye of Sauron hovering on Canadian islands. Don't get me wrong though, something had certainly happened to Darren, yet if I had to choose between the two options above, I'd gravitate towards a healthy dose of skepticism regarding the details he provided. There are audio recordings of his testimony floating around the internet, so feel free to have a listen. My ears automatically pick out a very nuanced and subtle question mark after literally every sentence, indicating he wasn't all too sure about the story himself, but maybe that's only my impression. No, um, I don't know, I haven't listened to it, but I just think as a kid he's just, you know, He's just elaborating. He's just blowing it out of proportion to make a cool story. That's okay. He's a kid. Eyewitness testimony is terrible at the best of times. Oh, when it's children, it's it's 
<laughs> it's gonna be even more terrible. The killed hens were also a grim sight, but maybe not that much of a mystery after all. Sudden explosions are not for the faint of heart, both metaphorically and literally. Chickens are known to drop dead from car horns, let alone sudden blasts visible to satellites. I didn't think of that. That's totally reasonable. Hence, to some extent, their demise was expected. I don't know about the blood, though. This might have just been a stylistic exaggeration on Mr. Bickford's part. Yeah, but they picked up those chickens, right? Was the blood on the chickens or was there not? That's really important detail. I'd like to know. I guess the scientists didn't release that information, but I'd like to know whether because Mr. Bickford saying it is just one thing. The scientists being like, no, they were bloody makes it very different because that you don't get bloody when you die of shock. Another thing I'd like to discuss very briefly is the presence of the so-called men in black. In a way, it sort of suggests that any time they show up, there's something ominous and mysterious afoot. This is a fallacy, though. The strange events are causing their presence, not the other way around. Just imagine if federal agents had been there. Picture an explosion of unexplained causes amid the Cold War, where the feds just not giving a hoot. Wouldn't that be much weirder? Sending out your specialized investigators is obviously the first thing that you do in such a scenario, and their being a bit strange and secretive is clearly a part of their job to some extent. I wear suits on a daily basis. I loathe talking to people, and for all intents and purposes, I'm a bit of a weirdo. Does this make me part of a global conspiracy? Well, yes, I am, and I must not say any further, but it has nothing to do with my demeanor. And that's where we end today's episode. <laughs> we don't know what it is. Yeah. An hour. And, uh, yeah, mystery not decoded at all. <laughs> to go to the unknown failed today. I don't even have a guy. You've known my best guesses around the episode, and that's that. Dennis as well. Thank you for listening to today's episode or watching if you're on YouTube. Uh, if you're on YouTube, like, subscribe. If you're listening as a podcast, please leave a review. It makes a huge difference. It gets this show in front of more people. And thanks again for watching or listening. See you next time.